Herzlich willkommen, meine Damen und Herren. Was haben islamische Fundamentalisten, Rechtspopulisten und Feministinnen gemeinsam? Sie alle sorgen sich um ihre Identität und suchen nach Anerkennung. Das zumindest behauptet mein heutiger Gast, der einflussreiche US-amerikanische Politologe Francis Fukuyama. Herzlich willkommen. Thank you very much. Ja, vor knapp 30 Jahren wurden Sie auf einen Schlag, kann man sagen, weltbekannt. Damals zeichnete sich das Ende der Sowjetunion ab, der Fall der Berliner Mauer. Wir sehen hier Bilder davon. Und Sie sagten, Sie stellten die These auf, dieses Ereignis bedeutet das Ende der Geschichte. Was haben Sie damals damit gemeint? Well, first of all, the term history was being used in a very specific sense. Uh, it was the same sense that the Marxists used it. They also believed that there was an end of history. History meant a process of development or modernization where you go through different stages of civilization. And the argument was what lay at the end of that process. That was the end of history. And the Marxists said the end of history was communism. That was mm. the final stage of human development. Uh, and my observation back in 1989, when I wrote the original article, The End of History, with a question mark at the end, mm -hmm. uh, was that it didn't look like we were ever going to get to communism, uh, that uh, what the Marxists called bourgeois democracy was going to be the final stage because there did not appear to be a, a higher level of civilization to mm -hmm. which we were going to evolve. And so that was the argument. And I think we were right in the middle of a big wave of democratization at that moment, which was capped off by the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was the argument that uh, this, um, not that democracy was universal, but it was the trend and this mm -hmm. was the highest stage uh, of, of development that mm -hmm. you could reach. Mm -hmm. ah, zu diesem Zeitpunkt zeichnete sich ab, dass es eigentlich zu den li li liberalen Demokratien hin tendiert, zu marktwirtschaftlichen Systemen, also eher mm -hmm. zum Kapitalismus als zum Kommunismus. Jetzt haben Sie dieses Buch hier oder den Aufsatz, vor, wie ich gesagt habe, vor knapp 30 Jahren geschrieben. Hat sich diese These bewahrheitet heute? Well, so we went through what um, the political scientist Samuel Huntington called the third wave of democracy. Uh, so between 1970 and about 2010 or so, the number of democracies in the world increased from 35 to something like 115. Uh, so there was a really big uh, wave of democracy throughout the world in Asia, in Africa, in uh, Latin America. Uh, that period has... I think clearly come to an end and mm. we're now in a reverse wave where there's now rising threats to democracy. So those are threats from uh, authoritarian countries like Russia and China uh, and also by a rising wave of populism. Mm. And so I think the progress to democracy has been interrupted. And of course, the big question for the future is whether this is a permanent setback or mm. whether this is simply a, you know, like the stock market goes up and then sometimes it goes down, but then The long -term trend is und, und, positive. und was sind die Ursachen dieser Krise der Demokratie, die wir erleben derzeit? I think that uh, part of it is the result of the globalization that's occurred in the world. So um, it's not just that democracy has done well. A certain set of liberal ideas took hold throughout the world. Uh, the idea that we should have Uh, openness to trade, to investment, to the movements of people. Mm. And over the last 40 years, there has been an incredible um, uh, explosion, really, of uh, this kind of interconnection between societies. Uh, that has made a lot of countries richer, but not everybody has benefited from this. Mm -hmm. So I think that in many developed societies, in many rich societies, a lot of working class people have seen Uh, their jobs moved to Asia, to other mm. parts of the world. Mm. Uh, they've seen uh, an influx of foreigners uh, that was uh, made, you know, highlighted, you know, by the, in, in 2015, by the migrant crisis uh, that hit Europe. Uh, and all of these, I think, have triggered a backlash, a populist backlash against uh, this trend towards increasing openness in the world. So I think that's the immediate A trigger for these uh, developments. Mm -hmm. Und interessant ist auch, Sie sagen, ähm, die Ursachen für diese Welle des Rechtspopulismus, das sind nicht primär wirtschaftliche Ursachen, Abstiegsängste der Mittelschicht, sondern kulturelle. 
Ursachen. Angst vor Identitätsverlust. Well, that's right. I think that uh, the conventional explanation is an economic one, but I think that economic loss is frequently uh, interpreted in cultural terms. So if I lose my job, uh, or if I'm making less uh, uh, income than my father was, I see this as a loss of status. And I think that you can interpret that, you know, by blaming it on foreigners, by blaming right. it on foreign competition or immigrants into the country that are taking your jobs or, you know, undermining the basis of the, of the welfare state. Uh, so I think, see, the, the thing that's, I think, quite interesting is that we had a couple of big economic failures in both Europe and the United States in the 2000s. So there was the, uh, the big um, uh, subprime mortgage crisis in the U.S. in mm -hmm. 2008, and then there was the euro crisis uh, here in Europe. Uh, these were uh, engineered, in a sense, by big banks, by, you know, the elites, and it hurt ordinary people. And you would normally expect that this would lead to a rise of left-wing populism. Uh, so the parties of the left should capitalize on this and do well. And instead, what you saw was the rise in the United States of the Tea Party and in Europe, uh, all of these anti-immigrant, anti-European uh, union parties that um, are pushing a much more nationalistic, uh, narrower sort of line. And I think that that's testimony to the fact that the cultural dimension is really important, mm -hmm. this identity mm -hmm. dimension. Uh, and not simply the economic inequality that we are uh, seeing today. Mm -hmm. Und da finde ich Sie sehr originell. Sie haben schon in Ihrem alten Buch, aber auch im neuen Buch über Identity, bringen Sie einen Begriff, nämlich einen Begriff, den schon Platon verwendet hat aus dem Altgriechischen, nämlich Thymos. Mm -hmm. Ein Streben nach Anerkennung, vielleicht auch ein, ein Sehnsucht danach, stolz auf etwas sein zu können, auf eine Identität, mm -hmm. die man hat. Mm -hmm. ähm, warum ist dieser Thymos so wichtig für Sie? Well, so, Thymos is a Greek word that, that refers to the universal human characteristic that we want people to respect us. We, we're not just interested in material uh, uh, goods like food and drink and, and money. Uh, we also want respect from our fellow human beings. And in fact, we're willing to give up uh, economic benefits for the sake of respect. Uh, and I think that this is one of the big drivers of politics. Uh, actually, the great philosopher Hegel said that the whole historical process was driven by a, a demand for respect, that, that slaves were mm -hmm. rising up against their masters, you know, at the time of the French Revolution, because the slaves did not receive the basic, you know, respect or dignity that they uh, felt they deserved as, as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is one of the big drivers in, in particularly in modern politics, this demand for dignity and respect by particular groups. Mm -hmm. Ist eigentlich eine anthropologische These, sagen Sie? Also den, das zeichnet den Menschen aus, das ist ein Grundbedürfnis und die Politik muss das irgendwie auch äh, befriedigen. Gibt es da irgendwie empirische, psychologische Studien dazu, dass dieses Bedürfnis so wichtig ist? Uh, there, are, well, there are certainly uh, a lot of studies uh, that show that there's a biological basis for this. So, there's a neurotransmitter serotonin, which uh, the brain emits, you know, when you have feelings of, of uh, uh, respect, you know, uh, and this is even true among uh, primates, other primates like chimpanzees. If you achieve alpha male status, you have heightened levels of serotonin. So there's a biological yeah. um, ground for this. But I think that culturally, uh, there's a very specific modern form of this demand for dignity which, in my view, you know, we just celebrated last year the, the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, the Reformation, and Luther's writing in particular, encapsulates a certain modern understanding of this demand for respect, because what he said is that what makes a Christian believer in God's eyes is not the outer person, it's the inner belief. Mm -hmm. You can't see the inner belief, it's not evident in, in rituals and, and, and so forth. It's, it's basically the inner faith of a human being. And that is what has value. And, and that's the modern view of respect, that we have this inner source of dignity. The outside world does not recognize that dignity. And it has to make an adjustment. It has to come and, and, and recognize us. And in fact, that's what happened following the Reformation, that um, Luther 
completely undermine the basis for medieval Christianity by attacking the church and you know, by saying that there is a different basis for belief. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Es ist wirklich interessant und dieses, dieses Bedürfnis nach Anerkennung des eigenen Werts, das sagen sie so zentral, dass es ganz unterschiedliche Phänomene der heutigen Zeit erklären kann. Den Rechtspopulismus, also so Phänomene wie Trump, Brexit, mm -hmm. aber noch andere Phänomene. Sie sagen auch die, mm -hmm. die MeToo-Bewegung, also feministische Bewegungen oder mm -hmm. etwa die Black Lives Matter-Bewegung, also schwarze mm -hmm. Bürgerrechtsbewegung und sogar religiösen Fundamentalismus, also zum Beispiel den islamischen Staat. Mhm. Würden Sie sagen, letztlich geht es da überall um dasselbe Grundbedürfnis, das dahinter steckt? Well, so first of all, it's very important to say that not all of these movements that you mentioned are of equal moral stature. So um, uh, they may be driven by a similar uh, psychological need for respect and dignity, but I think, you know, uh, You know, we, we, we've seen the emergence in the U.S. and other countries of this Me Too movement uh, among women who are trying to push back against uh, sexual assault uh, and sexual harassment. And like you said, the Black Lives Matter. Uh, and these are both responding to real injustices, okay. you know, injustices in the way that women are uh, treated. Now, you could say that Vladimir Putin is pushing back against, you know, this denigration of Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But the way that he's expressed this, mm -hmm. uh, this resentment is by trying to then dominate all of his neighbors, like Ukraine and Georgia and the Baltic states and so forth. And morally, this is not the same as, you know, a, an African-American pushing back against police brutality. Mm -hmm. But I do think that psychologically, Uh, there's a similar ground that, that people feel that they have this inner worth uh, mm -hmm. that is not being respected and the demand in politics is to get it respected. Mm -hmm. Also sie unterscheiden psychologische Ursachen und die sind ziemlich ähnlich bei diesen Bewegungen und dann die moralischen Gründe dafür und yes. die sind dann natürlich andere bei der MeToo-Bewegung, beim Feminismus und bei der schwarzen right. Bürgerrecht That's Bewegung, right. finde ich interessant. Ähm, aber warum definieren wir uns heute so sehr über Gruppenidentitäten? Wir könnten ja sagen, es ist ein Zeitalter des, Libera äh, des Individualismus, mhm. aber es irgendwie möchten wir heute Anerkennung finden als Teil einer Gruppe. Warum ist dieses Grupp Gruppendenken heute so stark ausgeprägt? Well, I think there's a number of reasons for this. The premise of a liberal society is that we're all individuals and I think the earliest manifestation of what we call identity politics was a demand for personal liberation. If you look at the hippie movement in the San Francisco Bay Area in the 1960s, you know, you had people that said society is, is preventing me from actualizing my fullest potential and mm -hmm. I need to liberate myself. But I think the problem is that people, when they dig down inside themselves, oftentimes don't find a unique person there, what they find is, is a kind of vacuum and a desire for connection to other people. And so the real me uh, living inside all of a sudden becomes my connection, my community with other people. And this is what I think has driven this group uh, nature of, of uh, okay. identity. Uh, you know, for example, we've had this big upsurge in Catalan nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so after the fall of Francisco Franco, you know, a lot of Catalans were happy that they were living in a democratic Spain, but then for many people that was not enough, that, that they, they felt that they needed more content to their identity. Uh, they had a common language and a history that was different from that of Spain, and so I think that's the origin of this drive, you know, for, uh, for a separate um, uh, recognition of, of Catalonia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Es ist ja schon interessant, ähm, wir leben in, in einer Zeit, wo wir ungeheure Freiheiten haben. Und trotzdem, wenn man sich anschaut, was wichtig ist, ist es das, was unverfügbar ist, was wir nicht ändern können. Die Hautfarbe zum Beispiel, das Geschlecht, mhm. äh, die eigene Geschichte. Mhm. Ähm, warum ist das so? It's, it's very ironic, I think. Um, the, the origins of this, I think, are that Uh, people are treated uh, as members of groups, right? So you have a person that is black or, you know, Muslim uh, or female, and the outside society uh, stereotypes them. It, it treats them as members of the group. They, they don't look at their individuality. You know, that's what we call prejudice, racial prejudice, or, 
you know, sexual discrimination, gender discrimination. Uh, and I think that these groups uh, and, and the people within them push back against this group identification. But in the process, they, you know, they, they came to see that group, you know, they want to raise the self-esteem of that group. And so they say, well, actually, yes, we do have a separate identity. Uh, we're not just like everybody else in the society. We have our own experience. So African Americans, you know, clearly have a life experience with dealing with white racism. Women have a very different experience from men. I think you see in the feminist movement, one part of it wanted women to be treated identically to men in terms of pay and promotions and job opportunities. But there's another aspect of feminism that said, no, actually, women are not just men. You know, men actually have all these problems. They're, they're aggressive. They don't know how to cooperate. They don't have, you know, virtues that, that, that women have. And so, therefore, uh, you know, the fullest um, manifestation of our identity is actually not to be just like men uh, with all their vices. We want to be, you know, we, we want to be something uh, separate. And so I think this is part of the dynamic that's led to uh, this return of biology in a certain sense where uh, the way that you're born determines uh, mm -hmm. the way that you behave and think and, and act in politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Und was dazu kommt, ist noch diese, dieser Wert des Authentischen, dass man echt ist. Also es geht so weit, dass Donald Trump zum Präsident wird, weil er political uh, correctness verletzt und weil er sich über Behinderte und Frauen lustig macht und so weiter. Mm -hmm. Hauptsache, es ist irgendwie authentisch. Warum ist dieses echte, warum hat das so einen großen Stellenwert heute, dieses, dieses Well, Inhalt? authenticity has been cultivated in Western thought for a long time. This is not something new. So in my book, I go back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the great um, Genevan philosopher, <laughs> uh, who uh, argued that uh, all of society, in a sense, is phony. It's, it's, a, it's a false imposition <coughs> of rules that you know, the earliest human beings were isolated and happy individuals, and they're made unhappy by the fact that they're living in a society that encompasses them with all of these restrictive rules, uh, and that the valuable person is that inner person, uh, the authentic inner person, who oftentimes we are not even aware of uh, uh, living inside us. Uh, and so really, I think ever since Rousseau's time, and, and this is also, I think, reflected in other you know, important thinkers like Kant, who said that it's our moral agency inside us that gives us value as human beings. Mm -hmm. So it's this um, uh, inner self that is authentic, that is of value. And this evolves in the 19th century into a belief in uh, the inner creativity and value of the inner person. And this is something in Western thought that's been with us for, for you know, quite a while. Jetzt kann man sagen, das ist ja eigentlich etwas Gutes, wenn man sich so für benachteiligte Gruppen einsetzt und sozusagen den Einzelnen zu seinem Recht kommen lässt, Selbstentfaltung mhm. und so weiter. Ähm, jetzt sagen Sie aber, die linken Parteien, die sich das auf die Fahne geschrieben haben, mhm. sind zu weit gegangen mit dieser Identitätspolitik, wie das, mhm. wie das genannt wird. Das heißt, dass man ähm, eben für Minderheiten sich einsetzt mhm. und so weiter. Ähm, wie ist es dazu gekommen, dass äh, zu dieser Identitätspolitik der Linken und jetzt auch auf der rechten mhm. Seite? Well, I think that there's just been a general reinterpretation of inequality on the left, so that uh, it used to be a general economic uh, category. So if you look at 20th century politics, communist and socialist parties all were in favor of helping the working class, which through most of the 20th century were white, you know, people of the dominant ethnic group in the society. But increasingly, uh, marginalization came to be seen as a property of these specific discriminated against minority groups. Mm -hmm. And these parties began to lose touch with the white voters that had been the core of their support, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the early years. Um, there's also, I think, an adoption of a kind of ideological multiculturalism that said that actually equality does not mean equality of individuals. It means an equality of groups. And we're going to, you know, try to raise the esteem of, of these cultural groups as a group, even if 
that group discriminates against individuals within, you know, w um, uh, among its members, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that's not compatible with a, you know, with a truly liberal society. What happened at that point is that a lot of the white voters, members of the dominant ethnic group, began to feel, you know, the agenda of this party is not my agenda, uh, and so there. There have been huge defections, both in Europe and the United States, away from the left-wing parties towards these right-wing groups mm. that are seen as more protective of the identities of, you know, this, this older class of, of working-class voters. Mm -hmm. So the Democratic Party has lost a lot of working-class voters to the Republicans over the last 30 years. The Communist Party in France, uh, you know, used to be a solid uh, proletarian party. Now a lot of those people vote for the National Front, uh, so similar things have been going on in, you know, in all over Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, also Sie sagen nicht, dass es irgendwie schlecht ist, dass man sich für diese Minderheiten eingesetzt hat, sondern man hat eigentlich die weiße Arbeiterschicht äh, vergessen und die Armut und die Ungleichheit aus dem aus dem Blick verloren. Die 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 Linken. Parteien. Man hätte einfach, einfach beides mhm. machen müssen. Sozusagen. Mhm. Das war schon richtig, mhm. sich für diese Minderheiten einzusetzen, aber das andere hätte man genauso gut machen müssen, würden Sie sagen? Well, I think, uh, I think that's right. I think that um, there's also a cultural phenomenon going on where it became politically correct to emphasize, you know, the rights of minorities, the rights of women, the rights of gays and lesbians, uh, that sort of thing in the interest of, you know, basic social justice, but uh, it meant, you know, in, in a certain sense, a downgrading of the attention that is paid to, you know, older people that are uh, older, not in age, but older groups uh, that had been the dominant mm -hmm. members of the society. So in the United States, for example, uh, it's true that, you know, in Hollywood or in uh, the two uh, dominant parties or in elite culture, uh, you know, white working class people have not been the object of their attention, even as they were losing jobs uh, through outsourcing and, you know, foreign competition. And I think a lot of those people felt, you know, very resentful that they had been forgotten mm -hmm. uh, by the system. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is then driving the resentment that has led them to vote for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Aber sie, sie gehen noch einen Schritt weiter und sie sagen auch, unsere Gesellschaften, äh, wie man das in den USA sieht, zersplittern in diese Gruppen. Und äh, was ist daran eigentlich so gefährlich aus Ihrer Sicht? Well, I think that you, if you think about the Middle East, that's the, or the Balkans, that's, uh, those are regions where identity politics is the whole of politics. You know, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, Somalia, these are societies that have actually fallen apart because they don't have any overarching sense of national identity. They're made up of identity groups that are made up of, um, uh, defined by ethnicity, by religion, uh, by sect, uh, by tribe in some cases, uh, and nobody has a sense of loyalty to a higher political unit that will allow them even to remain uh, together as a single, you know, as a single uh, group. In most European societies and in the United States, uh, there have been minorities, but, you know, there's an effort to integrate them into the dominant society so they don't remain permanent minorities. They don't remain, you know, identity groups that speak their own language and have their own customs living in parallel to the, you know, to the dominant society, or at least that's been the hope. In the United States, I think this has been more successful than in Europe, but I think that's the danger uh, mm -hmm. here when you have immigrant communities that are not adequately integrated, that don't feel that they're fully members of the dominant society mm -hmm. and then begin to live separately and that this is something that continues you know into the second third generation. Mm -hmm. Ich möchte mit Ihnen gleich noch über ihren ihren Lösungsvorschlag sprechen, nämlich über diese nationalen Identitäten, die sie die sie fordern. Zunächst aber äh, eine persönliche Frage, wie steht es denn um ihre Identität? Mm -hmm. Ähm, mm -hmm. Was hat ihre Identität am stärksten geprägt, wenn sie auf ihre Biografie zurückblicken? So, uh, my grandfather on my father's side came to the United States from Japan in 1905. So it was 110 years ago, more than 110 years ago. He didn't want to be uh, drafted into the Japanese army to fight Russia in the Russo-Japanese War. Uh, he 
established a hardware store. My father grew up in Los Angeles. He uh, was very Americanized. He spoke a little bit of Japanese, but really not very well. I don't speak any at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in New York City. There was never much of an Asian community there when I was growing up in the 1950s and 60s. So I always thought of myself as an American, mm -hmm. um, not as an Asian American, not as a Japanese American. And I would say that <clears throat> this was also my father's experience, that uh, we were not treated you know, particularly differently from other kinds of Americans just because we were you know, racially different. Und Sie wurden auch nie gefragt, woher kommen Sie ursprünglich oder woher kommen Ihre Eltern? So, yeah, so people would, would, would ask that. Uh, but, you know, my answer would always be, well, I, I came from Chicago or I came, you know, Get where it. I was born. And, but the thing is, in America, uh, I think it's been possible to give that answer for quite some time, you know, that, that what it means to be an American is really not defined by ethnicity. It's defined by, uh, you know, by your belief in a certain set of American values, by actually by the way you speak English. Uh, if you speak English with an accent, you know, you're, you're regarded as a little bit outside the community. But if you, if you don't have an accent and you, you act like an American, I think you're accepted as an American. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, that's really what troubles me about the current situation in the United States, because you're now seeing the rise of white nationalists who actually are going backwards. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to drag the country back into an ethnic understanding that what it means to be a real American is to be a white American. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would be a terrible loss if, you know, if, if they're successful in, mm -hmm. in doing this. Also, Sie sind heute ein dezidierter Gegner der Politik von Trump. Sie haben aber, kann man sagen, politisch die Seiten gewechselt, äh, ungefähr um 2003 vor dem Irakkrieg. Davor waren Sie ein, im Umfeld der Neokonservativen, haben mit äh, Paul Wolfowitz zum Beispiel auch 1998 zum Sturz von Saddam Hussein mhm. Äh, mhm. aufgerufen. Und dann vor dem Irakkrieg kam die Wende und Sie haben sich distanziert und sind heute bei den Demokraten, könnte man sagen. waren davor auch lang politische Berater mhm. in Thinktanks äh, von, von, von Reagan und mhm. von äh, Bush Senior. Mhm. Was hat den Ausschlag gegeben für diesen politischen... Well, I think a lot of that was just a reaction to things that happened in the real world. So in the 2000s, I think the biggest events were the Iraq war, which I think was a huge foreign policy mistake. Uh, I began to see that, you know, prior to the war, and it actually turned out to be a much bigger mistake than even I anticipated. And the other was the financial crisis in 2008. Mm -hmm. and, Both of these were built upon certain conservative ideas. You know, the first was built upon this idea that the United States could use its military power to reshape the politics of a culturally very different region. Uh, and the second was built on a kind of uh, excessive uh, liberalism that said that markets unregulated uh, would take care of themselves. And both of them, I think, turned out to be profoundly mistaken. And so. Uh, the other thing I think that's a background to this is that because of these very liberal policies, there's just been a great deal of growing inequality, especially in, in Britain and the United States, which, have, you know, they started the, the, this so-called neoliberal revolution with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher uh, pushing to dismantle social protections, you know, to uh, defund social policies, to deregulate. Uh, Part of that was justified, but a lot of it went much too far, and the result was a massive rise in inequality over the last 30, 40 years. And so, you know, I think the world changed, and that's why my politics have changed. I think it's. Aber Sie würden nicht sagen, dass Ihre Position damals in den 80er, 90er Jahren falsch war, sondern damals war es richtig. Well, yeah, I, I do think that there was a there was a good reason for for Reaganism and Thatcherism, because I think by the 1980s, a lot of the welfare state policies of many advanced countries had become unaffordable. They had led to hyperinf hyperinflation, uh, you know, stagnant growth. There was too much regulation in many areas. So I, yes, I do think at that time, mm -hmm. uh, loosening up uh, some of those um, encrusted uh, uh, state policies was, was a good idea. Uh, but, you know, I think in public policy, we have these pendulum swings where, you know, during the Great Depression, we had too liberal a policy, so then they started regulating things. 
that led to stagnation by the 1970s, so we deregulated, and then we, each time we go a little bit too far, and that produces you know, a reverse mm -hmm. wave, uh, I think, in the way we think about uh, how to deal with the economy and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Jetzt heute in Ihrem neuen Buch äh, Identity äh, schlagen Sie etwas vor, und zwar, dass man diese Zersplitterung de der Gesellschaft aufhalten sollte und wieder in größeren Kollektiven denken und sich identifizieren sollte. Mhm. Nämlich, äh, Sie fordern so etwas wie nationale Identität yes. und eine Art von Nationalstolz vielleicht mhm. auch. Können Sie diese Idee ein bisschen erläutern und begründen? So, um I actually gave a lecture, on, uh, a Latsis lecture in Geneva back in, I think, 2010 or 11 on this subject in, in a European context. Um, because the European context is different from the American one because of the European Union. So in Europe, the founders of the European Union, uh, in a sense, saw national identity as the enemy, that the two world wars had risen out of aggressive ethno-nationalism, mm -hmm. Uh, and the European Union, in a sense, was designed to replace uh, the member state identities of France, of Britain, of Germany, uh, with a kind of European, pan-European identity. Uh, this was, you know, the post-national vision of someone like Jürgen Habermas, you know, the German uh, philosopher. And I think it was a very noble idea. In certain ways, the European Union succeeded, you know, spectacularly in reducing the possibility <coughs> of a future war between Germany and France, for example. Uh -huh. But the one thing they did not succeed in doing is actually creating a real European identity that would replace the identities of, you know, the particular countries making up the European Union. And I think the Euro crisis. Uh, Ev uh, was great evidence of the fact that this had been a failure. So after the crisis, Greeks and Germans, mm -hmm. I think, were much more conscious of how they differed rather than what they held in common. You know, so the Germans were willing to take care of the weaker members of German society uh, with a welfare state, but they were not willing to see the Greeks as part of a large family that they, you know, had a responsibility for, you know, for, for taking care mm -hmm. of. Uh, and so I think in Europe, Uh, you still need an integrating identity. It would be nice if you did have this strong sense of Europeanness, but I think for the time being, uh, we are stuck with the individual, you know, national identities, and that's important because you have to integrate people. Uh, you have to have a set of commonly shared beliefs in the basic institutions and the legitimacy of the basic institutions of your democracy if you're going to have a successful democracy. Aber ist das, reicht das denn, so ein Bekenntnis zu diesen Grundwerten, zu der Verfassung des eigenen Landes? Oder, also es wäre so etwas wie der wie Jürgen Habermas Verfassungspatriotismus genannt hat. Reicht das oder braucht es mhm. mehr? Braucht es so etwas wie einen gemeinsamen Lebensstil, eine mhm. Leitkultur mhm. zum Beispiel, die in, in Deutschland mhm. ja auch äh, heftig diskutiert mhm. wird? Mhm. Well, it depends on what you mean by light culture. <laughs> so the term light culture was invented by actually a Syrian, a, a, a professor who had been born in Syria and then taught in Germany for most of his life, uh, Bassam Tibi. And his understanding of that was a culture that was, um, you know, not defined by religion or by, you know, a, a very deep set of cultural habits, but really, a kind of allegiance to these Enlightenment principles. So it, it went beyond simple allegiance to the Constitution. You know, there, there was a more substance to it, but it did involve, you know, a belief in the kind of Western values that underlie, I think, modern uh, democracy. And in that sense, uh, I think that, you know, that's valuable. I think it's true that just a bare allegiance to political principles is probably not enough to hold a society get, uh, together. There are mm -hmm. deeper traditions having to do with rituals, with holidays, with food, with a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where you get into trouble, because not everybody, you know, shares in, in some of those um, habits. Mm -hmm. Können Sie vielleicht ein Beispiel geben, wo zum Beispiel eine, ein, eine muslimische Person ähm, bestimmte Tradition aufgeben muss, äh, um sich an, dieses, an diese Leitkultur anzupassen, aus Ihrer Sicht ganz konkret? Was, was bedeutet denn das? 
So there, I think the answer is fairly uh, clear. So in many Muslim communities, uh, the families want to have their daughters marry somebody uh, that they approve of. And so oftentimes the daughter is sent back to Morocco or to Pakistan or, you know, where the family comes from and is subjected to an arranged marriage. Uh, there are other issues, I think, having to do with anti-Semitism, with, you know, hostility to, you know, gays and lesbians uh, that actually, you know, characterize the communal views of that, uh, you know, that society. But, but stick with the example of the daughter. I think that although that is a cultural practice that is widely accepted in the Muslim world, it is incompatible with basic uh, liberal democratic principles in a liberal democracy, we think that all people, including all women, are agents, meaning they have freedom of choice in the most important decisions that they make in their lives, particularly who they're going to marry. Mm -hmm. And the family uh, in a liberal democracy should not have uh, the right to force the daughter to marry someone that she doesn't want to, to marry. So that's an example, mm -hmm. I think, of where a cultural practice steps over the line and be begins to violate, you know, a basic underlying principle of, you know, of liberal individualism that, you know, is the basis of, of our kinds genau. of democracy. Aber im, im Rahmen dieser Grund- und Menschenrechte ist doch kulturelle Vielfalt äh, möglich. Mm -hmm. Aber ich habe den Eindruck, Sie haben etwas gegen diesen Multi Multikulturalismus. Was mm -hmm. ist denn daran so gefährlich? It, it, it depends on how you define multiculturalism. So one definition is just an empirical observation that there are many cultures that are coexisting in your society. But there's a kind of ideological version of multiculturalism that says that all cultures, including Western culture, are equally valuable and should be equally respected. Uh, and this has led to a couple of consequences. So there's one kind of extreme version of um, multiculturalism that's actually anti-Western, you know, where its proponents say, no, Western culture is based on slavery, colonialism, racism, that's the essence of Western culture, and that's bad, uh, which I think is just, it's, it's kind of a ridiculous assertion. I mean, it's historically correct in certain ways, but it's mm -hmm. also very, you know, uncorrect. But the other version of it, I think, that's problematic is that all cultures have to be treated equally as cultures. And I think that that is simply a mistaken understanding of the basic principles of a modern democracy. Uh, pluralism does not mean uh, a cultural pluralism. It means a pluralism of individuals. So individuals have rights that are superior to the rights of the cultural communities that they uh, live under. Uh, and therefore, I think in a proper liberal democracy, we have to protect the rights of individuals and not necessarily the rights of cultural groups. We make concessions mm -hmm. to cultural groups because people want to live in, in, in different ways. But, you know, as that example of the daughter that doesn't want to get married, you know, in an arranged marriage shows, I think that there are limits to the tolerance that you can have for certain kinds of cultural practices. Mm -hmm. Also keine zu starken Zugeständnisse, keine Sonderrechte für andere Kulturen, die irgendwie das Grundrecht äh, überschreiten, das, das fordern Sie. Sie sprechen aber immer von Assimilation an diese bestehende Bekenntnisidentität, mhm. an diese nationale Identität, nicht von Integration. Mhm. Und Integration scheint etwas zu sein, ein wechselseitiger Prozess, wo sich ein Land, eine Kultur auch verändern kann, durch Zuwanderung. Mhm. Aber Sie, bei Ihnen klingt das so statisch. Also man mhm. hat diese Identität des Landes und alle müssen sich daran anpassen, die in diesem mhm. Land leben. Mhm. Well, I actually regard integration and assimilation as, as, as very similar kinds of terms. I think that uh, Certainly, it's, it's incumbent on the dominant, you know, cultures to recognize that there are other ways of doing things and other, you know, there's a diversity to uh, the way that your citizens are going to live and you have to be basically tolerant and, and accepting of those. But I think it's also the case that a modern democracy has its own culture. It, it has a certain culture that has to do with accommodation of tolerance, of belief in individuals, belief in, you know, fundamental equality, uh, and that those are cultural values that I think, you know, uh, are very difficult to compromise. And so it can't be a completely two-way exchange where, you know, you start accepting some essentially undemocratic values simply because, you know, you want to try to accommodate people that are 
uh, coming into the country that have you know very very different values from the ones that really shape your society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wir haben über dieses Gemeinschaftsgefühl äh, gesprochen und wenn man sich fragt, wie man das herstellen kann, ähm, diese gemeinsame Kultur, diese Identität, ähm, dann ist die Frage, ob es reicht, wenn man einfach eine Verfassung hat oder bestimmte Grundrechte ob es, oder ob es auch Traditionen, bestimmte Rituale braucht. Mhm. Und äh, meine Kollegin Barbara Bleisch mhm. hat vor einiger Zeit mit dem US-Politologen Mark Lilla gesprochen, mhm. der diese ganze Debatte über die Identitätspolitik und die Kritik an der Linken angestoßen hat. Und er meint, es braucht ein bisschen mehr, um ein Gemeinschaftsgefühl yes. herzustellen. Wir hören uns das ganz kurz an. We have to understand what kind of creatures we are. To begin with, there are a lot of unreasonable people. Uh, there are a lot of busy people. There are a lot of uneducated people. How do you bring together a nation like that? Well, you do it symbolically. You do it with symbols. You do it with, um, with rhetoric. You do it by talking about your history. And even, and, and especially, you can't just focus on the bad things in your history. You have to be able to tell the good things that people can be proud of that will pull them together. You have to involve the whole soul, so to speak, platonic soul, not just the rational part. Ja, Sie, mm -hmm. Sie nennen den, zum Beispiel den Militärdienst mm -hmm. als eine Form von, äh, mm -hmm. wie man eine nationale Identität stiften. Yeah, well, that's one thing you have in Switzerland that uh, we don't have in the United States any longer. But no, I think Mark Lila is right. Uh, you do have to have these common symbols. So uh, last week in the United States, we celebrated Thanksgiving, which is, I think, uh, to me, the most uh, important national holiday in the United States. Uh, it was created deliberately. You know, it, 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 there's a Thanksgiving story about the pilgrims coming to the U.S., but it was really uh, formalized as a national holiday by Abraham Lincoln. And part of his uh, uh, intention was to bring the country together after a terrible civil war that had led to 600,000 Americans dying uh, on the battlefield. Uh, and that, uh, I think, you know, succeeded in many respects because that's something that actually all Americans do uh, share. The sport of baseball, actually was also created in the late 19th century, again, in order to incorporate the southern states back into the Union after the Civil War because, you know, there was a feeling that we needed some common pastime that all Americans would identify with and, you know, it would become a unifying symbol. Uh, in my book, I mentioned this film Invictus about South Africa. Uh, Nelson Mandela, the first president, the first black president of South Africa, um, uh, the, the, the movie centers around his decision to try to make blacks in South Africa support the, uh, the, the Springboks, which was the national rugby team, because in South Africa, under apartheid, the blacks played football or soccer and the whites played rugby. And the rugby team was largely white. And he also realized that you needed these common symbols. And so what he wanted to do was to try to make rugby a national sport mm -hmm. rather than just a sport for the white Afrikaners. Mm -hmm. And so this is, I think, an example mm -hmm. of the way that, that visionary leaders create, you know, common symbols and a common culture. Sport is a good example. Also man mm -hmm. hört da immer wieder, dass Fußball auch diese mm -hmm. integrative Kraft hat. Und, äh, aber es kann auch problematisch sein. Man mm -hmm. sieht dann bei den Nationalspielen äh, mm -hmm. singen einige die Hymne und andere mm -hmm. schweigen. Mm -hmm. Alles Schweizer. Yeah. Ähm, und das löst dann Diskussionen natürlich mhm. äh, auch aus. Mhm. Sie plädieren eigentlich in Ihrem Buch, das hat mich überrascht, gegen Doppelbürgerschaften. Also man sollte nicht mhm. Bürger von zwei Ländern sein. Was ist denn daran problematisch? Well, so I think that the issue for me is that dual citizenship uh, is something that is of great convenience to certain individuals who are very cosmopolitan. You know, they move around, they, maybe their wife comes from a different country or their husband, um, or they have immigrated or something of that sort. But it does seem to me it creates a, a real problem because not all countries actually believe in the same uh, principles. It's not so much of an issue when the two countries are both good democracies and, you know, both have a, a set of shared values, but uh, in some cases, that's not, uh, you know, that's not the case. 
And if you have loyalties to a country that is... Zum Beispiel you know, bei der Türkei oder Russland? Well, oder so the, yeah, the example I gave in, in, in the book was Turkey, which has become an increasingly authoritarian country under uh, President Erdogan. And, um, you know, he has explicitly targeted uh, Turkish citizens in Germany to vote not for politicians that they thought would be best for Germany, but the politicians that would be best for Turkey. Mm. And I think that's an example of a divided loyalty. You know, I think if you're a German citizen, you ought to think of what's best for Germany. And uh, so that's that's the mm. reason I, I don't like, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of uh, dual citizenship. Obviously, if there's a possibility of war, it becomes much more problematic because you ah. then really have to decide what side uh, you're on. But even mm. short of war, I think that uh, it, it's a it's a it's an issue for uh, you know countries that really have different values. Mm -hmm. Wir haben jetzt viel über diese Zuwanderung äh, gesprochen und tatsächlich scheint die Migration eine ganz zentrale Ursache zu sein für diese Identitäts. Verlustängste, diese kulturellen, die wir angesprochen haben. Und ähm, wir alle kennen die, die Bilder von den Flüchtlingsströmen. Bei uns äh, war das Ende 2015, ähm, die, die Kriegsflüchtlinge aus Syrien. Ähm, hier sehen wir die, die Flüchtlinge auf der Balkanroute und im Mittelmeer. Und derzeit die Bilder mhm. von der mexikanischen Grenze zu den USA. Ähm, Sie fordern bessere Grenzkontrollen? und strengere Einbürgerungsverfahren. Mm -hmm. Was heißt das ganz konkret? Well, I think that, uh, and, and this is a difficult issue to speak about because I don't want to be identified with Donald Trump because he said things that are similar to this, but I do think that you can't have a democracy unless you can actually define who the people are, and you can't define who the people are unless you can actually control your own borders. Uh, so uh, it becomes very problematic when people cross into your country uh, illegally. Now, my personal attitude is that immigration is necessary and it's a good thing for most societies. Uh, it leads to economic growth. I think the cultural diversity is good for societies. But uh, if, there's no, if there's no limit to it, and in particular, if the rate of people coming in exceeds the uh, ability of the country to absorb them and ultimately to you know to integrate or to assimilate them then i think you've got a problem aber wenn es zu schnell geht und zu viele sind dann darf man selbst syrische kriegsflüchtlinge abhalten oder was bedeutet das yeah but the thing is that uh, well i have very <laughs> i have a more complicated view about about that sort of issue uh, Yes, that's right. Uh, on humanitarian grounds, uh, it, um, it's too bad that you can't take everybody. But, you know, honestly, if you look at the demographics of the world, there's a lot of people that are going to want to come to rich countries, you know, not just now, but in coming generations. And the question is, can you continue to have viable, uh, you know, developed societies if you don't actually try to control that process to a rate, you know, at which you can actually... Um, uh, assimilate people. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's been going on in Europe that people don't talk about that much is that the openness to immigration has been depopulating uh, large parts of Europe, uh, Eastern Europe. So if you look at Ukraine, Serbia, Romania, you know, Bulgaria, these countries have been, they've been emptying out. They've lost, you know, sometimes 20, 30 percent of their population over the last generation. And a lot of times these are the, these are the most uh, skilled, educated, ambitious people that have gone off to live in London or, you know, Hamburg or, or wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm not sure that, you know, either for the sending countries or for the receiving countries that politically, you know, a completely open immigration system is really you know, the best one. Mm -hmm. Aber es ist schon überraschend, dass Sie in dieser Zeit, wo man denkt, die großen Probleme, die die Menschheit hat, sind globale Probleme, Migration, ähm, Klimawandel, Digitalisierung auf eine bestimmte Weise. Ähm, und Sie plädieren in dieser Zeit wieder zurück zum Nationalstaat, Grenzen stärken, Nationalstaaten mm -hmm. stärken. Wa warum? Uh, like I said, I think this is actually a basic democratic principle. So a democracy is based on the sovereignty of the people. And the, the difficult thing is, who are the people that, that uh, you know, you're talking about? And that's why uh, I think you actually have to be able to control borders because if you cannot have a people that is, you know, set off from other national groups that's the locus of political power in the society, 
you actually can't have a democracy. I think it is actually critical to maintaining the possibility of democracy uh, in the first place. And so that's why I, I think, you know, you can have sympathy for migrants, for refugees. I think that there's a moral obligation to take care of as many people as you can, but it's, it's simply not an unlimited um, Uh, responsibility. Aber man könnte sich ja auch die EU als eine demokratische äh, Institution mm -hmm. vorstellen, ähnlich wie die Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika. Also überstaatliche Organisationen könnten ja auch mm -hmm. irgendwann mal demokratisch sein, vielleicht irgendwann ein Weltstaat. Mm -hmm. Well, cer certainly, I mean, that's the, the vision. But I think that the problem in the EU is that you can't have the principle of uh, open travel, you know, within the Schengen Zone. Uh, free travel without visas and passports if you actually don't have secure outer borders. And, uh, you know, you can have one or the other. You can either have limited travel within uh, the zone and open borders on the outside, or you can have free travel on the inside, but secure borders on the outside. And right now the EU, you know, they've been working towards securing the outer borders, mm -hmm. but, you know, they put a tremendous amount of pressure on Italy and, and Greece, which are now the main... Uh, you know, conduits for people trying to come into uh, Europe. And I don't think that that's a sustainable situation. Mm -hmm. Mich würde noch so Ihr, Ihr Blick auf die globalen Probleme interessieren, ähm, auf die globalen Kräfteverhältnisse, auch im politischen. Also wenn man sich jetzt den Aufstieg Chinas äh, mm -hmm. ansieht, äh, unglaubliches Wirtschaftswachstum in den letzten Jahren, Jahrzehnten, mm -hmm. damit auch politische Macht verbunden, Droht da ein neuer kalter Krieg zwischen China und, und den USA, mm -hmm. wenn man auch jetzt die Handelsstreitigkeiten äh, ansieht? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think that there has been a big change in public attitudes towards China, which is largely the result of Chinese behavior. Uh, both in Europe and in the United States, the business community used to be the biggest advocate for cordial um, interdependent economic relations between the West and China. Mm -hmm. And that's changed completely over the last few years because I think the Chinese have not been playing by the rules of the international trading system in terms of stealing intellectual property, not providing reciprocal access to their markets in the way that they are provided access to, to Western markets. Um, And, you know, you now have a leader, Xi Jinping in China, that has announced a big industrial policy to subsidize, you know, Chinese high-tech industries, uh, which is not compatible with, you know, the, the global system of, of a rule-based uh, economic system. And so I think it's inevitable that there's going to be heightened tension. Yeah. Uh, in addition, Chinese foreign policy has, uh, ever since 2008 or so, turned much more aggressive. And so they've been militarizing these islands in the South China Sea. None of China's neighbors agree that they own the South China Sea, but they, you know, that's that's been their assertion. So I think that, you know, it's, I mean, I don't blame China in the sense that uh, it, you know, countries behave like this as they become more powerful. They begin to, their ex ambitions expand and, and they become, you know, more aggressive. But that doesn't mean that you don't need to push back against that. So I do think that the, Uh, overall conflict with China is going to deepen as, as time goes on. Aber es könnte ja sein, dass China uns zeigt, dass es erfolgreichere politische Modelle gibt als die Demokratie, nämlich einen Staatskapitalismus. Und well, um, we'll have to see about that. I think there are a lot of weaknesses in the China model. Uh, for example, the China model has been based on accumulating huge amounts of debt over the last 10 years. Uh, so the Chinese level of indebtedness, you know, is one of the highest of any countries in the world. Uh, they can keep this going only so long. Uh, and I think at a certain point, this engine of growth is going to, you know, is going to give out. When that happens, I think it's very hard to predict. But uh, it's not clear to me that China is going to continue to be as successful an economic uh, player. Politically, I think they've also got problems because... I don't think that they've got an intrinsic source of legitimacy the way a democracy uh, in the West would have a, a legitimacy based on its adherence to democratic principles. Mm. And mm. so both politically and economically, China may be in trouble in the future. Mm. Wir sind schon fast am Ende des Gesprächs. Mich, mich würde noch interessieren, Sie leben in Stanford, äh, mitten im Silicon Valley, wo die großen Utopien der Zukunft äh, entwickelt werden. Verschmelzung von Mensch und Maschine, äh, Unsterblichkeit, ähm, 
Wie zuversichtlich sind Sie, dass es den Menschen in 100, 200 Jahren, so wie wir jetzt sind, noch, noch geben wird? So, um, I think that actually this utopia in Silicon Valley has turned into a kind of nightmare over the last few years. Uh, I think that the, the benefits of information technology and the Internet to democracy was accepted universally back in the 1990s when the Internet got started. But I think with uh, the elections in 2016 and the Russian weaponization of the Internet, the Chinese ability to control their Internet uh, and to seal their society off, uh, I think it's very clear that the Internet is not necessarily a friend of, of democracy. Hmm. The other thing that's going on is, you know, with the advance of automation and artificial intelligence, a lot of jobs are being uh, taken away, especially from lower skilled workers. Uh, and that's one of the things that's driving populism and, and this rising anger uh, against elites. Uh, and I think these are trends that unfortunately are going to continue. I really don't want to make a lot of predictions, you know, because it's very hard to <laughs> know really how to, uh, technology is going to Uh, advance you know, in the future, but I do think we have a number of challenges facing ja, us. Das klingt gar nicht äh, rosig und äh, es ist schwierig, da die Hoffnung zu behalten. Vielen herzlichen Dank trotzdem für dieses unglaublich interessante Gespräch, Francis Fukuyama. Thank you very much.